Good morning and welcome to KAUST Live. We're coming to you from KAUST campus and the Winter Enrichment Program. This year's theme, Human Machine Future, aims to explore the way that technology engages with our daily lives. Here to talk to us about that is neurologist and neuroscientist Eve Ajid. Eve, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, so you, um, you are at ICM currently. Uh, yeah. Tell us a little bit about ICM and the work ICM you do. is a sort of uh, pilot experiment in our country. It's uh, private foundations, but uh, doing public research. Um, it's a neuroscience institute uh, located just in the center of Paris. We have 600. Uh, investigators, mm. uh, uh, exclusively in the field of neuroscience, doing molecular biology, cellular biology, physiology, mm. cognitive research. So quite large. Yeah. And um, it's closely linked to the Department of Neurology and Psychiatry, so that uh, uh, it's uh, what we could call translational research mm -hmm. there. So, but it's quite recent. We opened uh, six years ago. And uh, well, as I say, it's a pilot experiment mm -hmm. with good, res good research, I hope. Right. Um, what kinds of translational research are you aiming at? Well, the idea is to uh, be close to clinicians mm. so that in the, in the Institute, one floor is devoted to uh, clinical research. We have a clinical research center with uh, 14 beds. Uh, where patients are coming just to, uh, to, p to be part of uh, uh, research programs. Mm. And we have also an incubator with 20 startups. So that, um, the yeah. idea is that the, the um, discoveries made in the Institute will be uh, used for the patients on one hand of and course. for drug companies on the other. Mm -hmm. Any, um, any pet projects that come to mind that you're excited about or that? We have a lot of uh, uh, core facilities, including uh. Uh, neuroimaging, and we have a PET scanner, and we have several MRI, mm. uh, three Teslas MRI, et cetera. So the, I mean, the uh, facilities are quite good too right. for the investigators there. And, and in terms of the startups, are, are any of those notable? Uh, One of the startups mm. uh, just left us, made a, a nice discovery, I think, mm. in the field of multiple sclerosis. And might, I was told that this uh, startup was supposed to be bought for uh, $1 billion. Oh. So, <laughs> so it's, we will see, we will see. Right, right. <laughs> it's just the beginning, you know. Right, six years, as you said. Six years, yeah. yes. So, so tell me a little bit about your background. Uh, you said you're, you're both a, a clinician as well as a researcher. Uh, I was <coughs> the uh, chairman of the Department of Neurology for years mm. in the past, not anymore, and on one hand, and I had the big laboratories in the field of uh, neurosciences uh, strictly devoted to the uh, mechanism of mm. cell death and the treatment of patients with uh, neurodegenerative diseases, mm. such as Alzheimer or Parkinson. Wow. So, so I am both a medical doctor and a, a scientist, if I may say so. Right, and, and um, as I understand, you're one of the most highly cited researchers uh, we, we've had on campus. Talk a little bit <laughs> about some of the, the research that's led to that. Well, <laughs> mostly in the field of uh, Parkinson's disease, which mm. uh, was taken as a model. Uh, again, translational research. In my lab, I had molecular biology and cell biology on one hand, mm. trying to find uh, uh, the mechanism of nerve cell death and the cause of these disorders, mm. with some success, some success, not entirely, unfortunately. There is a lot of work still to be done. Mm. And on the other hand, uh, physiology in animal, so animal experiments, and in patients. Mm. And at the moment, I, since uh, this is done, I try to get uh, uh, scientists, well, uh, investigators involved in the humanities. I try to get philosophers, historians, sociologists in the institute because 
I think it's very important to yeah. have also people who are trying to uh, think a little bit about what is science and what will be the future of science. Yeah. I, uh, so, th so these are both as test subjects and as um, contributors or, or? At the moment, <coughs> there are students. For instance, I have ah. two students. One is a philosopher and a postdoc. Mm -hmm. One is a philosopher and the other is a historian. And we are precisely w writing a big article on the history of glial cells. Very good. On glial cells uh, since the beginning of the 19th century to uh, up to date. Mm -hmm. So, so talk a little bit about glial cells. Um, they've become, I think, a recent research interest for you. Yeah. What, what caused that? You know, in <coughs> my uh, previous life, I, uh, my lab was only working on neurons. Mm -hmm. um, why, why do they work uh, in the wrong way? Why are they, uh, what? Why are, uh, do, do they suffer and why do they die mm. in uh, diseases such as uh, uh, Parkinson or Alzheimer? Mm. And uh, the glial cells were quite neglected. And uh, after several years, I started to understand that, of course, our brain is uh, composed of uh, billions, billions, and billions, exactly uh, eight. Uh, 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 85,000 uh, uh, 80, uh, billions of neurons in our human brain, which right. is less than one and a half kilo. Mm. And, uh, but there are e even more glial cells than neurons. So I, 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 I was surprised to, to, to discover that there were so many, there were so many glial cells uh, beside the neurons. That's on one hand. And then the other thing I was, which struck me uh, very much so, was the fact that I, uh, I discovered that, in fact, the more glial cells you have in your brain, the more intelligent you are. For instance, in the leech, there are only uh, one glial cell and for six neurons. Mm. But in the human brain, the ratio between glial cells and uh, neurons is 1.2. So that uh, there is, during the evolution, the complexity and mm. the number of glial cells is increasing much more than the number of, of neurons, mm. which is uh, an index maybe, which might suggest that, in fact, the more glial cells you have in your, in your brain, the more intelligent you are. But correlation is not relation. So right. that, uh, but this uh, struck me, and this is why I went to uh, see my friend Pierre Magistretti, who is really a guy working on glial cells his years and years, and we, we wrote a book together. Right. Um, he's mostly a, a cellular biologist and a biochemist. I, I'm more involved in, phys in the field of physiology and uh, pathologies of the nervous system, so um, that's it. And th these cells have uh, uh, extraordinary properties. Not only do they have the properties of neurons, for instance, they have uh, they release neurotransmitters, they have receptors. Uh, these glial cells are talking uh, with, uh, there is a dialogue between the neurons and the, uh, gl these glial cells. Um, uh, uh, but in addition, they have two extraordinary properties. One is that they uh, uh, do not produce current, electric current. Mm. They are silent, they are mute. And uh, this is why they have not been studied so much, because when you place an electrode on a neuron, mm -hmm. then you are recording a, a, an action, poten uh, a poten action potential, mm -hmm. electric current, but not, in the, not at the contact of uh, glial cells. So that's, that's the problem. But on the other hand, mm -hmm. these uh, cells are producing, are communicating with each other mm. in a very complex manner uh, through the production of calcium. They send waves of calcium, uh, which on large, in large volume of the brain, and um, very slowly. And it's a way of communication between astrocytes and between astrocytes and neurons. And this is why I'm so interested in terms of physiology and uh, physiopathology. Uh, is uh, the, the, the point is that 
these astrocytes probably play an important role in integrating all the message uh, from the neurons and allowing to synthesize and to synchronize all the information brought up by the neurons. We receive a myriads, myriads of myriads of information just at the moment, for instance, uh, the both of us. And uh, you may ask the question, how does it work in the brain? I mean, all these information, where do they go? Uh, neurons are like electric wires. Uh, it's like, you know, you have uh, highways, you have avenues, you have small streets, all, all everywhere. It's very complex. You have to keep in mind that in one cube millimeter of tissue, you have uh, uh, about one billion of connections in one cube millimeters. Yeah. About, no, no. Where do these uh, information go. Mm. And the, I think that these glial cells <coughs> are there in order to integrate all these information and also to synchronize them in order to provide a message uh, in order to, uh, to, uh, to uh, uh, provoke a, a, a given behavior. For instance, if, mm. uh, if I do this, um, this is so specific. It's very specific, very selective movement. If I, t if I talk, etc., um, uh, then um, the, the, the glial cells are mm. probably very mm. likely probably playing a role in order to uh, ensure the specificity of our behavior. Mm. Uh, just something in, 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 in parenthesis. Um, when I use the word glial cells, in fact, you have several types of uh, cells there. Mm you have uh, some of the cells called microglia or aimed at uh, uh, fighting against uh, inflammation, uh, infections. It's a sort of immune system. You have the oligodendrocytes, which, are, uh, which is playing a very, very uh, an important role uh, for neurons because it's uh, the origin of myelin, mm -hmm. that is the sheath of lipids which uh, surround the axons of the neurons. Mm -hmm. And when I'm talking about glial cells, I'm talking about the most important of these cells, mm -hmm. which are the astrocytes, mm -hmm. which are really close to, to the neurons. Astrocytes means uh, uh, the form of a star. Aster is star, mm -hmm. and site is cells, astrocytes, called mm -hmm. astrocytes. So when I use the word glial cells, I'm in fact talking about astrocytes. Yeah. Um, so the, the glial cells sound like they do an awful lot for the neuronal cells. Um, talk a little bit about if those aren't functioning correctly, what you're finding for Alzheimer's patients, patients with Parkinson's. These cells are playing an important role in neurotransmission. Mm -hmm. That is all the mechanisms which uh, allow the brain to function correctly. Mm -hmm. But um, they play a very important uh, role therefore in all our behavior, memory, sleep, uh, learning, uh, circadian circle, sleep, I said, uh, mm. probably emotions such as uh, uh, romantic love, everything. Mm. But in addition, when these astrocytes are dysfunctioning, mm. then the, uh, they play a role in all kind of pathology of the nervous system. I have several examples that we will discuss uh, next. Uh, for instance, uh, uh, Alzheimer's disease, in mm -hmm. Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's disease, epilepsy, multiple sclerosis, stroke. Wow. Uh, also, all these genetic disorders that you find in uh, infants, in, uh, in children, in infants, uh, you know, these rare genetic disorders which are so uh, terrible such as Alexander disease, for instance. Alexander disease is a uh, disorder that you find in infants. Uh, these uh, children uh, are dying after several months. Mm. And this, for, this disease is, uh, results from a very specific mutation exclusively in astrocytes. In other words, dysfunction of these astrocytes is able to induce dysfunction of neurons and these dysfunctional neurons lead to the symptomatology of all kinds of disorders uh, or concerns. But uh, the, the, the big question is, do these astrocytes, these glial cells, 
play a role through the uh, work of neurons, mm -hmm. or do they have a, uh, a potential of activity by themselves? You see, when uh, so that that still re may remain a question for the future. For instance, uh, <coughs> uh, we have two big questions. One is. Uh, to, to, to see exactly what are these glial cells, mm. these astrocytes, but here there are probably several subtypes mm. with different functions for each of these subtypes. That, one, that is one avenue of research for the future. The second is really to see whether uh, uh, we could find drugs acting specifically on these cells. Mm. Uh, because so far, for instance, if I take the example of Alzheimer's disease, uh, um, just an idea, uh, during the last uh, uh, 10 years, uh, 10,000 trials of drug have been attempted. Only one was a success, and this drug, I know it, it's so weakly active that I don't use it. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's a big, uh, it's a big uh, problem for us to find new drugs. But all these drugs are... Uh, from our colleagues from the uh, pharmaceutical industry, all these drugs are uh, conceived in order to, uh, to be active exclusively on neurons. Right. The targets are <coughs> neurons. And we wonder now that perhaps we should find uh, targets not only on neurons, but also on uh, these glial cells right. and probably to uh, find new drugs acting on both the neurons and the astrocytes. Perhaps that would be uh, uh, something very, very, very important for the future for the patients, I think. It, it, it sounds like, <coughs> excuse me, it sounds like uh, because we're able to measure the electrical activity of the neuronal system that we've been focused, but maybe the, the frame needs to change either to an ecosystem or to the glial cells more specifically. Um, indeed, that's, uh, that's true. Um, you know, uh, the, these glial cells and the neurons were described at the same time, at the beginning of the 19th century. Wow. And suddenly, in the, at the beginning of the 20th century, mm -hmm. exactly in 1920, uh, suddenly research in the field of glial cells stopped. Mm. And the reason is simply because these uh, cells are not producing any electric current, as I said, yeah. which is not the case uh, of neurons. And these, uh, the, since these years, there has been an explosion of discoveries with neurons, mm. still today, fortunately, but um, uh, this wasn't the case for uh, the glial cells because uh, they could not be recorded. Mm. They were studied exclusively using morphology, histological uh, techniques. Uh, but uh, fortunately, since uh, 1950, and essentially during the last 20 years, an enormous amount of discoveries have been made with these uh, glial cells, mm -hmm. as we briefly discussed. Mm -hmm. And I hope that in the future we will really, really um, be uh, more efficient not only f to find new drugs acting on both the, uh, astro uh, the glial cells and the neurons, mm -hmm. but also in terms of uh, cognitive research. Why do we think? Why do we perceive? Why do we speak? Why do we have memory? Why mm -hmm. are we able to uh, induce a personal uh, strategy of action, etc., etc.? These, uh, what we call cognitive research, if you, if you, if you uh, agree. And um, then, uh, for instance, we have models of the functioning of the brain by Edelman, by Linus, by Jean-Pierre Changeux and many others, mm. exclusively based on the functioning of neurons. Even the famous uh, Human Brain Project in Europe, for instance, is exclusively based on the function of neurons. Mm. Uh, I think it's stupid. We need to add uh, the function of uh, the um, glial cells as well. Mm -hmm. uh, why have we forgotten this, uh, this half of the brain? Uh, really, I don't know. So it's time to, 
to be uh, efficient again by studying uh, both the neurons and the glial cells. Right. And, and I believe, actually, this is part of the subject of your talk uh, later today. You, you refer to glial cells as the forgotten part of the brain. Talk a little bit about, uh, more about why that is. Well, it's, as I said, it's because uh, during at, at least 30 years in the middle of the 20th century, mm -hmm. uh, these cells were not studied anymore because mm -hmm. uh, they were not producing electricity, right. which is not the case of neurons. Right. That's the main reason. But now we have, for instance, we know that these uh, cells are indeed producing small currents, what we call re resting potential. Mm -hmm. Uh, and they have uh, unbelievable biochemical properties which uh, we, we don't need to forget and uh, we need to take into consideration uh, in, uh, these properties to, as I said, to understand more deeply uh, how the brain is functioning and also to find new treatment for patients. Right. Which leads me to my final question, which is, uh, what do you see as the, the future of this research? Um, what, what are the things, areas you're going to... I see three things, essentially. Mm -hmm. uh, to be sure that there are several uh, subtypes of these cells mm -hmm. with different function, because at the moment, as I say, we have only the microglia, the myelin, and the astrocytes. And the astrocytes are probably have a lot of subtypes. Mm -hmm. Uh, second, um, uh, 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 what's the role of these uh, glial cells in the genesis of cognitive functions, mm -hmm. mental functions, such as memory, for instance? And third, uh, probably what, what is exactly the dysfunction of these glial cells in uh, many disorders, such as the neurodegenerative disease for for which we have no uh, curative treatment. Mm. We don't know how to cure these disorders, mm. which is uh, uh, a difference from uh, other uh, disorders uh, outside the, the brain, for instance, uh, you know, in, in the, the, our body. Yeah. We, we know how to treat most of the disorders in our body, but not here. Mm. <laughs> That's a big problem for us. I incredibly. That's yeah. the most important problem for the future, I think. Mm. Well, thank you. Um, do we have any questions from our audience here? <coughs> we do indeed. Um, Sam Salami is reaching out to us from our online audience. Um, you've discussed a little bit about the extent to which microglial cells play a role in Alzheimer's disease. Um, can you also talk a little bit about their interaction with amyloid beta? Yes. In, uh, in Alzheimer's disease, as you know, uh, we have uh, senile plaques, uh, which are composed of uh, beta amyloid on one hand in the center, and uh, a lot of uh, uh, deposits of uh, dead neurons at the periphery, including a lot of microglial cells. Well, these microglial cells can be protective uh, at the beginning of the disorder, pro very probably, uh, in particular through the uh, production of uh, cytokines, cytokines soft out, such as TNF-alpha, for instance. But after above a certain threshold of uh, tissue suffering, then these microglia uh, start to be deleterious and try to kill the, uh, the, the neurons. Mm. And this is probably what happened in, the, in Alzheimer's disease. So the, the microglial cells, in fact, are, uh, they are called, they are part of the glial, these microglial cells are part of the glial cells, but in fact, uh, they are totally different. They are sort of macrophage, as you probably know, uh, as we see in, the, in our blood, and they are supposed to ensure uh, uh, our uh, immune defense. But in Alzheimer, they play a role. But astrocytes are also playing a very important role. Uh, that's perhaps the most important on in two ways. First, uh, the accumulation of beta amyloid uh, in the astrocytes is probably responsible for the death of neuron on one hand. And secondly, as you also perhaps know, um, um, ApoE, which is a, a lipid, 
produced exclusively by astrocytes play an important role in the uh, occurrence of this disorder. If you are ApoE2, uh, the risk of uh, Alzheimer is very low. If you are ApoE4, then the risk of Alzheimer is increased by eight. So astrocytes are probably uh, represent at least uh, from my, my opinion, a excellent target to treat patients with Alzheimer. We have another one? Yeah. We have a question here from Sophia, who wants to know if it's possible to grow new glial cells in the brain. Uh, in contrast to, to neurons, which are mature, and which do not divide, meaning that uh, the, uh, at, at, at start, when you are a young adult, you have uh, 85 billions of neurons, but when you are a centenary, you have still the same number of neurons. Uh, this is not the case for astrocytes, because they, uh, they can multiply, they can divide and multiply. Um, whether you can increase the number of uh, these astrocytes for any reasons in uh, different conditions, uh, I don't know whether we know that, that exactly. Mm. I, 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 I am not really able to, uh, to answer this question. But they can divide when you have a, a pathological attack of the brain of course, they divide, they multiply in order to defend, uh, in order to fight against the pathological process. But so the, these glial cells have, have a, a role to play in the plasticity of the brain, the, its ability to, to sort of change and adapt? Yes, <coughs> yes. But neurons do the same. Neurons also have some plasticity. Um, the cell body do, do not move, but the terminals can move very much so. Uh, this is playing a very important role in, in pathology and mm. uh, in physiology in general. For astrocytes, it's probably the same, but it's less known. I mean, the mechanism of uh, multiplication of these cells, to my knowledge, are not very well known. Mm. Yeah, because people often in cognitive science talk about building new neuronal connections. This is called neurogenesis. <coughs> okay. That's true. You get, new, can, uh, you get new neurons in two parts of the brain. One is the hippocampus and the other is a small area uh, close to the third ventricle in the middle of the brain. Uh, in small animals, this type of neurogenesis that is uh, that the uh, production of new neurons is probably playing a role, a very important role, mm. um, in order to, for instance, for uh, to fight against depression or to fight against memory disorder. If you have a problem with your memory, in humans, the number of neurons produced by neurogenesis is very small. Mm. So I have always some doubt. This is also a very interesting area of research for the future. Very interesting, yeah. Do we have any other questions? I'd like to know a little bit more about <laughs> some of the environmental factors which can play a role in the possibility of whether or not one develops uh, Alzheimer's. Um, for instance, lifestyle choices, um, dietary factors, um, smoking, exercise, mental activity, things like that. That's a totally different uh, question, mm -hmm. yes. Uh, very important one. Can, uh, because there are many paradoxes in the literature. I think if you want to be very objective, my profound thinking is that at the moment, none of this factor is playing a role in the uh, evolution of the disorder, briefly. But first, age is playing a role, probably. This is, I mean, this is common sense. Uh, of course, when you are becoming uh, very old, uh, these neurons, uh, the neurons in your brain become to be vulnerable, more vulnerable. 
and probably, I mean, this is a, this is a, a factor which is playing a role in the occurrence of Alzheimer's disease and in the severity of the disorder, very likely, although this is not really demonstrated. Second, uh, food. Well, so far, I am not aware of any, any, uh, I mean, scientific uh, paper showing clearly that food is playing a role or not. Uh, I don't see why there should be any reason for that. Of course, if you, <laughs> uh, if you, if you don't eat, for instance, of course, uh, you be, when you, if you are old, you become weak, and uh, your brain is obviously uh, suffering slightly. But this, this has nothing to do with, uh, with uh, Alzheimer. Tobacco. Uh, tobacco is playing a role in Parkinson's disease. The more you smoke, the less Parkinson's disease you get. <laughs> Which doesn't mean that you need to smoke and to get a uh, lung cancer uh, in order to protect yourself against Parkinson. But this is, I mean, there are at least dozens of uh, publications showing that uh, in epidemiology uh, there is a correlation between the consumption of tobacco and, uh, the, uh, and Parkinson's disease. But correlation, again, is not relation. Uh, it's probably more complex, etc. I could accumulate all the, these uh, factors. I don't see any one. I mean, the, 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 the problem of these uh, generative diseases is, 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 is briefly as follows. One, we all have uh, uh, predisposition factors, more or less. For instance, you have perhaps uh, 30 mutations, different mutations in your brain. You don't get the, the, the disorder. I have 31. But this additional mutation is the one which is playing a role and which allow the disease to occur, perhaps. And then you have obviously environmental factors because most of these disorders are sporadic. They are not totally hereditary, although hereditary diseases, neurodegenerative diseases do exist, in particular in Parkinson's disease, where you have 50% of familial cases. But in most cases, these cases are sporadic, which means that <clears throat> obviously environmental factors are playing a role. Which environmental factor? We don't know. It's perhaps not tobacco or you know, uh, drugs or anything, food. It's maybe something which is in the air. You don't know what it is. So this is a very important area of research, epidemiology, of course, in these disorders. But um, I mean, this type of uh, research needs to be much more sophistic sophisticated, I think, that, uh, than it was in, uh, in the past. Wow, fascinating. Uh, any other questions? <clears throat> we have one last question here from Huda, um, who, wants, who wants a little bit more information about astrocytoma. What do we know about that? Um, can, we, can astrocytomas affect the whole brain? Um, can we say it metastasizes? Yeah. Uh, indeed, except in children, young children, uh, where you can observe medulloblastoma, uh, neurons don't provide cancer in the brain for a very simple reason. They don't divide. They don't multiply. They are mature. They are adult. And therefore, they don't... Uh, when uh, in the, uh, in the uh, cycle, uh, cellular cycle, when a neuron is suffering, instead of multiplying it himself, like would do a, a cell in your, in your skin, then the cell decides to die. They commit suicide. It's called programmed cell death or apoptosis. In the case of glial cell, this is exactly the contrary. These cells are multiplying, and they are at the origin of several cancers in the brain. Mm. These, cancer of two these uh, tumors are two types. 
astros benign, so-called benign astrocytoma, uh, which grow very slowly, uh, and real cancer called glioblastoma. Glioblastoma is an horror. It's an horror because we don't know how to treat them. Uh, Antimitotic drugs can help up to a certain extent, so that the life expectancy of the patients are increased by two to four months, but no more than that. For the astrocytoma, uh, the so-called benign astrocytoma, they are, they are extremely <coughs> dangerous tumor. Why? Because it's not like a ball that you can get rid of using neurosurgery. It's, uh, it's a, a tumor with, with uh, uh, um, like a crab, with different uh, s sort of uh, collaterals, which infiltrate the whole brain. And that's a problem, because a neurosurgeon can get, can, uh, uh, get rid of the uh, core of the tumor, but not of the, of the, cr of the uh, members of the crab, if I can say so. So that's uh, one of the most uh, terrible problems we still have in neurology, that the treatment of astrocytes. And this is, why, uh, this is another reason why one, one should really uh, work out the problem of glial cells, of course, when they multiply too much, that is, when they result in cancer. Right. And any more questions? No? All right. <clears throat> well, Dr. Ajit, thank you so much for joining us. Oh, are you kidding? Thank you very much for the invitation. Fascinating discussion. <laughs> <laughs> and thank you to our online audience. Uh, join us back here at 11. Uh, we're going to have another uh, live interview, and that's all for now. Thank you.